Hello, happy people. Welcome to our daily devotional scripture that encourages you to pray. I want to encourage you to get out your Bibles. Tonight we're going to look at Luke chapter 13. We're going to focus uh, especially on verses 31 to 35. And I'm going to really use verse 35 as the jumping off point for our study tonight. So I want to encourage you to get out your Bibles, Luke 13. And um, I want to encourage you also uh, use lots of positive emojis, uh, share this broadcast with other people. When you do that, you are doing the work of the evangelist. Tonight, we are going to consider Jesus' teaching regarding the importance of repenting of our sins. And really, ultimately, the most important thing that we have to repent of is the idea that we can be right before God outside of uh, Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And so uh, we're going to have a, it's a super important uh, discussion we're going to have tonight. Um, and it's one I think you'll be able to bless other people with as well. So, hey, Rich, good evening. Please say hi to Cheryl. And um, I, I want to say thank you to our social media team. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Hey, Jan, good evening. Please say hi to Rick. Um, I want to say thank you to our social media team. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you for all that you do, welcoming people, explaining how social media works and our platforms and all of that. You're a tremendous blessing to do ministry with. So guys, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 13 and let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, who left heaven and walked upon this earth. And we thank you, Father, that your son, Jesus, taught us about the importance of setting aside our ideas, our ideas about what is a correct relationship with you look like. And not only to set aside our ideas, but to uh, receive his teaching, his wisdom, his will for our lives. And we thank you, Father, that you do this by the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit works in us. And so bless us, Father, in this faith that you have already given to us. Bless us in this faith that we would grow in this faith, that we would be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within us in a way that's gentle and respectful to those that we talk to. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking at Luke 13. I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles. Luke 13 is really kind of an interesting chapter. Uh, You know, it starts off um, with uh, Jesus teaching about the importance of repenting. And uh, if you don't repent, you will perish. And he teaches a, a parable about this, about a fig tree that's not fruitful. And then Jesus goes on in Luke 13 and, and uh, he heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath. And you can imagine how the religious leaders took to that. They didn't take to that very well at all. And they criticize uh, the woman who's been healed. <laughs> really a crazy thing. Um, then uh, Jesus teaches about the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast and how uh, very small things can be used to do amazing things uh, by God's grace. And of course, you know, you think of the sacraments, which are small in the eyes of the world, bread, wine, and water, and which God uses to do amazing things. And then he just talks about how, you know, the narrow door and, uh, and really he is that narrow door. And then finally at the end, um, Jesus is then confronted by these religious religious leaders who want to run him off. And so that's where we pick it up here, Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 31. So let me read for you verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. So thoughtful of the Pharisees, always looking out for Jesus' best interest. There was was no subterfuge in any of that. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. Jesus said to them, you can almost hear Jesus sort of laughing, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. You know, they 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 probably were hoping to catch Jesus saying something irate against Herod that they could then report back and, and start the gossip going. Oh, Jesus said this. Oh, Herod, go kill him quickly. You know, um... 
Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So Jesus knows he's going to die. Uh, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. So, you know, as I look at this, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of the plot line of many Western movies. Many Western movies have this sort of plot line where the good guy, the hero, comes into town. He stirs up quite a controversy, and then he goes from that town to the next town, and word about him travels ahead of him to the town in front of him. And when he gets into the next town, you know, who's there waiting to try and run him off but the sheriff? And why is the sheriff trying to run off the hero in the movie? Because the sheriff's either crooked himself or is defending uh, the interests of crooked people. And, uh, you know, so these Pharisees, this is kind of the role they're playing here with Jesus, like the sheriff uh, in the Western movie. But some things to note about Jesus and his response to uh, their shenanigans. Uh, Jesus is not daunted. He, he doesn't become scared by their words. He's not daunted and he's not deterred. He doesn't change his course, change his mind. No, he has set his face like flint to go towards Jerusalem. He knows there's an appointed hour for him to provide for the salvation and the righteousness of all mankind. Uh, and Jesus alone will determine when to lay down his life. These Pharisees, these religious leaders, they had uh, nothing more or less in their hope that day than they could have arranged somehow for Jesus to be killed immediately. Um, if they could stir something up between Herod and, and Jesus. But uh, Jesus and uh, Jesus alone will lay down his life at the appointed time and he will choose to take his life back up again three days later. And so I think it's important for us, you know, as we look at Jesus and the difficulties that he encounters, you know, when we hear disheartening news, and there's a lot of it, and, you know, just turn on the news at night, and a lot of it is very disheartening, unfortunately. But when we hear disheartening news, please, we should try to remember that nothing, in the end, ultimately, nothing can stop God's will. Jesus said, even the gates of hell cannot stop the church. The church is going to overcome all of these things. And so sometimes people wonder, I've had very devout Christians ask me, you know, will the church still be here when Jesus returns? Yes, the church absolutely will be here because that's what scripture says. And so when we hear disheartening things in the news, whatever they are, always remember that ultimately, in the end, nothing can stop God's will. The Pharisees sought to destroy rather than build, just like a lot of people today. And you know who they are. They're people who are always tearing down, always being negative. The Pharisees were those kind of people. Religious people, to be sure, but very negative uh, people in their heart and in their core. They sought to destroy rather than to build. And of course, in the end, they were the ones who were destroyed. We're going to look tonight at verse 35. It's, It's a very, very powerful verse. Jesus says, behold, your house is forsaken. And we're going to unpack that. What does Jesus mean here? Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you know, um, the first thing I think to to point out here is, um, There is an irony, a very painful irony going on in verse 35 when Jesus says, Behold, your house is forsaken. Because the word that's used there, the word that's used there is translated every other time in Scripture. The word that's translated forsaken is translated every other time in Scripture as forgiven. What? 
How is it that this word that's always translated forgiven is translated as forsaken here? Because what is at the core of being forgiven is being released. And so when you and I, when we are forgiven by God, we are released from sin's claim and stain upon us. But here in this case, in this situation, when Jesus says your house is released, Jesus is saying your house is released from God. In other words, this is not God's house anymore. This is your house. That's why Jesus calls it that. Your house is forsaken. And uh, who is Jesus talking to? The Pharisees. And what is their house? Their house is the temple. And so one of the things that, that, you know, we have to, we have to come to grips with here is that Jesus goes, when Jesus goes on and he says, I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the, the temptation is to look at that and say, oh, well, that, of course, that happened when Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're quoting from Psalm 118, which is this beautiful psalm. And it's, it's verse, uh, verse 26 there in Psalm 118. And, um, you know, and so the, the, the temptation is to look and say, well, that, that did happen. But you see, Jesus is, is not just pointing to this fact, this event that will happen. But what Jesus is saying is something much deeper, much more spiritually significant. You will not see me. You will not be one with me until you recognize that I am the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I am the agent that God has sent to be your champion, to fight the fight and to, to defeat sin and death and the devil. And one of the core things that we have to always remember as Christians is the, is the uh, particularity the, um, the, that, that, all, that salvation is only found in Christ. Salvation is given to us through no other means. And there are so many scripture verses that we could look at. So, for example, John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, No one will come to the Father except that they come through me. Acts 4 verse 12. There is only one name given under heaven by which men must be saved. And of course that name is the name of Jesus. Acts 13 verse 39. By him everyone who believes is freed from everything you could not be freed of by the law of Moses. Who's that him? Again, that him is Jesus. And Acts 16 verse 31. Believe upon the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Believe upon the Lord and you, the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. It's very important for us to, to, to just understand this very simple point that you are forsaken. A person is forsaken until they confess Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about. That when he says that you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And not just parrot those words, but believe those words. Speak that from a truthful heart that sincerely believes that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Jesus says here that uh, your house is forsaken. Well, it wasn't always their house. It was first, it was God's house. The temple was the house of the Lord. So how is it that God's house becomes man's house? How does that happen? And I want to share with you four things as I was reflecting on this for our devotion tonight. I want to share with you four things that I think led to that for the people of Israel. And these are four things that we then need to look at and ask ourselves, well, how are we doing regarding this today. I think one way that the house of God became the house of man for the people of Israel is that they quite simply, they began to worship other gods. And we see that, you know, over and over again in the Old Testament, that the people of Israel broke the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods. And they worship the gods, the false gods, small g, not capital G. They worship the false gods of other nations. 
And, and God, the one true living God, will not share his glory with another. And so then what about for us today? How might we fall into worshiping other gods? And I would submit to you that today, one of the ways in which a church or individual Christians might begin to worship other gods is by, for one, preaching or teaching universalism, that all roads lead to the top of the mountain. And that's simply not the case. That is not what uh, God tells us about a correct relationship with him. And I would also submit to you that another false God uh, today, that if we're not careful about, that we will begin to worship in the church and as individual Christians, is the God of small g, God of political correctness. If we're not careful, we will set aside worshiping the one true living God and seek to worship what culture tells us is the quote-unquote correct way to speak and to act and to think. And so we must guard our hearts and we must guard our churches so that our churches only worship the one true living God. The second way in which the uh, people of Israel... Uh, began to um, began to uh, turn the house of God into a house of man is that they bowed to the civil leaders. They bowed to the civil leaders. There were many, many false prophets uh, throughout the Old Testament who went along with whatever the king or the queen said or wanted. And it didn't matter if what the king or queen said or wanted was against the word of God. They bowed to the civil authorities. And so for us as Christians and for us as a local church, we have to, we have to be sober minded. We have to be alert. We have to be aware. Yes, on the one hand, we pray for all those who are elected, whether that's in political office or as judges or whatever the position might be. Yes, we absolutely, we pray for them, whether it's somebody we voted for or didn't vote for. We pray for them. We absolutely do. But we also have to absolutely hold whomever has been elected. We have to hold them to the standard of Scripture. And so, for example, you know, uh, I think of the legal system in our country. And our legal system in our country has said that there are certain things that are legal and acceptable in our country that are completely unacceptable in the eyes of God. And I'm not just talking about abortion. Although there seems to be some headway being made in that, uh, in that area and, and praise God for that. But I'm also talking about the ninth and the tenth commandment. The ninth and the tenth commandment says we shall not covet what belongs to our neighbor. And yet our Supreme Court has said that it's perfectly okay for a rich person to look at their neighbor's property and to say, you know, that property, um, I want that property for myself and I'm going to take that property. Yes, I will, I will have to pay them, but whether they want to sell or not, I can get that property. All I have to show is that with what I will do with this property will produce more tax revenue for this community than what but that person who owns the property currently uh, is doing with it. And so it doesn't matter if that property has been in that family for 150 years. Somebody covets it and they say, I want to put up this development or that development. And the Supreme Court has said, yes, you can take it. For a long time in this country, the only way you could take somebody's property is if it was for the benefit of everybody in the sense of a road had to go through or a military base had to be built or something that was no, from which no individual profited except that the whole community benefited from it. But that has changed. And so we need to, we need to stand up and we need to uh, say as Christians that our judges and our elected officials, that they need to be held to the word of God, even as we pray for them, even as we support them and encourage them. Yes, we also want you to, to listen to the wisdom of God. The third way in which God's house can degenerate into man's house is whenever man's teaching is placed above scripture. And Jesus runs into this buzzsaw 
all the time in the New Testament. The religious leaders, and we see it there in Luke 13, the religious leaders have all these man-made ideas and they've elevated them above scripture. And Jesus points out their hypocrisy and their false teaching over and over and over again. And we have to guard within the church that it's sola scriptura. It's scripture, not human tradition. Scripture stands as the highest uh, scale, the, uh, the ultimate guide and measurement of how we will live and act as a church and as individual Christians. And then the fourth way in which God's house can degenerate into man's house is when the people of God are not witnessing in the world. And that was, the, that was one of the purposes of the Jewish nation. They were to be a nation of priests, declaring, we read this in Exodus, they were to be a nation of priests, declaring to the world the goodness of God. But they just never did it. And so, and so here's the thing. If you're not outward focused, you're inward focused. See, the problem with the Dead Sea isn't that water never enters it. That's not why it's dead. No, there's plenty of water that enters the Dead Sea. The problem with the Dead Sea is that water never leaves it. It just stays trapped in there. And, and that's unhealthy for that body of water. That's unhealthy for a body of believers. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we must always be focused on the Great Commission. For us at our church, I try to wrap up every message with our mission statement as a church, which is that we will glorify God by spreading the gospel through our preaching, our teaching, and living our daily lives. And it's just, it's so important that in the end, that's the beginning of what we do next. In the end, that's the beginning of what we do next as we, as we witness in this world and we start in our own backyard, in our Jerusalem, if you will. And then from there, we go out further and further with the good news. And also, let us never forget, God is bringing the nations to us. You know, um, we don't even, you know, have to wait to have the opportunity to go around the world because the fact of the matter is that God is bringing the nations to us. And yes, this can be unsettling. And yes, this can be cause for concern. And these, and, and measures need to be taken. Absolutely. But for us as Christians, we need to rejoice at the opportunity to love our neighbor, to serve our neighbor, to care for our neighbor, and to care for them in the most deep and profound way of all, which is to share the good news that's found only in Christ. That they would also declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord. It's, this verse is from Psalm 118, verse 26, as I mentioned before, and it's uh, rejoicing. Uh, if you look at Psalm 118, verse 26 is about rejoicing. It's about, you know, giving God a praise clap for the human agent that God uses to bring Israel victory. And it will be spoken of Jesus when he uh, makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but it's, it's spoken of us in our hearts and in our, with our tongues as we confess Christ in this world. And why is Jesus worthy of our worship? I'm going to close with these thoughts. Jesus is worthy of our worship, first of all, because he is God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus asked the, asked the religious leaders, why do, you, why do you want to stone me? For which of these good works do you want to stone me? And they said, for none of these, but that you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus claimed to be God because he is God. Okay, So he's worthy of our worship because he's God. He's worthy of our worship because he defeated sin and death and the devil. Yes, he did. He rose again from the dead. He's worthy of our worship because he extends to us grace and faith and eternal life. That is worthy of worship because we need his grace. We need the gift of faith and we sure want the gift of eternal life. And so he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our worship because he sends the Holy Spirit to us, the Holy Spirit who brings us into faith and blesses us with an ever-increasing faith. So Jesus is worthy of worship. He is worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of our worship because right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he is praying for us. That's what it says in Romans. And finally, Jesus is worthy of our worship because soon and very soon he is returning. He's going to return with the blast of a trumpet and the twinkling of an eye. He's going to return with the angels in his train. 
And he came as a lamb. He's returning as a lion. And he's going to read out the names in the book of life. And praise God for when that day comes. Blessed, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is Jesus, Jesus himself. And he, he will be coming to take with him home those who are his. Let us be in that name. I want to close with this thought. You want to be joyful when you see Jesus. You want to be joyful. You want that to be a moment of rejoicing for you. And so I want to encourage you, confess Christ as your Savior. Say with your heart, say with your tongue, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Believe in your heart that Jesus is God. Confess with your mouth that he was raised from the dead. You will be saved. And trust me when I tell you that people will thank you People will thank you when they receive salvation by grace. So let us joyfully and confidently share this good news with those around us. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray you have a great evening in the Lord. That you are comforted by these words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because he came here for you, and he's returning. He's returning, and he's going to take you to be with his Father and the other believers in heaven. And praise God for when that day comes. Let's go in peace. Let's serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.